legislation. Legal standards. Legal standards ultimately define, in many countries, acceptable practice. They often are more important than what a profession is to say. So knowing the legal standards that guide test use in Romania and elsewhere become important. The laws are too diverse from country to country for me to uh, summarize them. There are some international technical standards. As you probably know, we have two strong international professional associations. Perhaps the most visible is the what we call IUCIS, the International Union of Psychological Science. And its mission is to build global interaction among research communities and to promote the advancement of psychological science and technology at the international level. It holds a work a, a conference every once every four years. This year it will be in Berlin in July, toward the end of July. Its members are not individuals. Its members are national associations. The other major inter uh, international association of psychologists is actually a, a, an offshoot of and committed primarily to IO psychology. And this is one to which you should belong because you can be a member. And it represents the international interests of I.O., the International Association of Applied Psychology. Its mission is to promote science and practice of applied psychology and to facilitate interaction and communication about applied psychology around the world. Neither of these two, neither of these two organizations has an ethics committee. smaller organization is the International Test Commission. And just you can go into Google or International Test Commission and it will lead you to this website. Its mission is to address cross-national issues that impact test development and use. Its members include national psychological associations, universities, testing companies, individuals, It has developed three important guidelines. There's a difference between guidelines and standards. Standards are those that you have to do. You have to do these. It's like the mother and father is establishing certain standards. You remember those conversations as a child or an adolescent who'd say, well, you know, every child, in, everyone else in the neighborhood is doing this. And your mother would say, well, we're not doing it in this house. We're, we're operating by a different standard. However, standards need to be enforced by someone, like a parent, or a licensing board, or a national professional association. No international association has the, that kind of impact. No international association can sanction you for unsuitable practice. Therefore, no inter international association has the ability to establish standards, has the ability to establish guidelines. They're weaker. These are suggestions as to what you should be doing. And there are three from the International Test Commission that apply to all work as psychologists. One is to guide or um, to, to discuss the first discusses the fair and ethical use of tests with the intent to provide an internationally agreed upon framework as a standard for training and for test users. The one that has impacted our work most directly is the second set of standards, guidelines, or not standards, guidelines on test adaptation. Uh, and I know that uh, it is being used quite broadly here in Romania. In developing countries, as we have established, test development typically has involved test and translations. You take a test from French or English and you translate it into your local language. That's no 
unsuitable. We've, we've moved into that era now where we are adapting them to the culture. And the guidelines, the ITC guidelines, provide assistance to persons in helping them to transform a test from one originally developed in a home country, that is the source test, to one developed for, more suitably for a local population. For example, here in Morgan, a Harvard population. So, two examples, we could adapt the test originally developed in the United States for one in, in China. Or we could transform a test from one developed in China with native-born Chinese speakers to one for one to use with, with uh, uh, in China for non-native-born Chinese speakers from Korea. So it, within a country that has a diverse population, we would use the test adaptation processes to ensure that the test is suitable within that country for the various populations or samples within that population for which that test was designed. And these guidelines discuss cultural and linguistic differences. They identify five technical issues and methods, and they describe preconditions that possibly impact test interpretations. A third area, and this is a very important with respect to I.O. psychology, important more to I.O. psychology than the other specialty areas, and that is the use of tests on that are computer-based and internet related. Many of the major testing companies provide tests internationally. How do we know that the person in South Korea who is taking a particular test actually is that person who should be taking the test? What are the conditions under which the test is administered? Of, of other conditions that may prevail over which we, if we're working, if, if we're working in London, we have no direct control over. And so we need guidelines to help to ensure that the tests are reliable and valid when delivered over the internet. In fact, that's to be expected. Because medicine would like to keep psychology under its wing. We would like to control psychology, particularly psychiatry. Psychiatry would like psychology to be those who work for psychiatrists. That was true within the United States. To some extent, it's true in Romania. Well, interestingly, and this is quite an aside, psychology in the United States now, in some states, they're gaining prescription privileges. They're able to prescribe and to monitor the impact of prescriptions. And of course, this frightens psychiatry, because within my country, psychiatry basically only dispenses medication. Very few psychiatrists are providing any therapy. But going back to the issue of diagnosis, there must be 300 or more diagnoses in the DSM or the international, uh, in any other international cohort. The diagnosis does not lead to any intervention. Knowing a person's diagnosis does not necessarily inform us as to the services that that person needs. Diagnosis might be used for actuarial purposes, for categorical purposes, for acquiring uh, resources through insurance or other forms of government sources, but if diagnosis does not inform the way in which we work with people. If we have a person with mental retardation, for example, we have two people with, who are mentally retarded, we would not think of working with those two necessarily in the same way. Or two persons who have autism. We would, our, our, our first task is to 
describe and then to individualize, individualize our services. So we're moving away from diagnosis. We want the public and the professional want to know more about the person, the diagnosis. We know that there are three broad qualities that impact behavior. Biology. And those who are young in the audience may adhere more to the second area, the environment. But I can assure you, let's say you're 25 now, and if I were to put your mother next to you, if we take just the limit, put my, your mother next to you at the age of 25, and then if we could fast forward you to the age of 50 and put your mother next to you at that point, you would appear more like your mother at the age of 50 than at the age of 25. That biology unfolds. And so the impact of environment actually is stronger at older ages than younger ages. The impact of biology is, in, is stronger at older ages than younger ages. God forbid, you know, you take a look at the medical history of your parents. Because you know it informs you as to the pathways that your medical health may take. So we have the importance of biology, we have the importance of environment. The third is personal choice. As psychologists, that's really the one that, over which we have greater control. A person has very little impact on his, bio, his or her biological history or what has been attributed genetically to that person. Has some control over the environment, we want all in and produce the environments. But it's a very, very personal choice. Those, those issues that we address every day, why are you here today rather than elsewhere? It's not because of your biological nature, it's not because of necessarily your environment. You made a decision. There was an individual choice you made today to come here. So much of the information that one needs may be acquired through interviews. We may not need tests or observations, or other non-test methods in order to describe behavior. So the process of, of assessing and interpreting test data is enhanced when we view it as a joint activity, importantly a joint activity between the professional who acquires the data and analyzes the data, and those with whom they work. When I look for a child who has emotional difficulties, I want that child, let's say an adolescent, who is 13, 14, 15 years old. I give my draft report to that, to that uh, adolescent, and I want that adolescent to read my report, because I want that person to form a partnership with me, and that partnership, in part, is seeing the accuracy of the ways in which I am describing this person on paper. Sharing that responsibility. We're finding one of my colleagues, I was at the University of Texas at Austin for 27 years. And one of my colleagues there is finding therapy to be much more effective when the clients originally come in and identify their issues he does the testing, and they do the interpretations. A joint activity. A joint activity. It's not that a psychologist is, has, is the fountainhead of all knowledge. I mentioned that decreasing an emphasis on diagnosis. We have five pillars in assessment. We can carry forward from this conversation anything. Think about these five pillars. In order to describe behavior, you must assess multiple traits, not one. Multiple traits. You must use multiple assessment methods. Observations, interviews, tests. A variety of sources to acquire information, not one. You must acquire data from multiple reliable sources. 
Describing beta, uh, beta, uh, a person's life may be much like looking at light through a prism. Different information will provide different inf different people will provide different information about those with whom you're working. In order to describe behavior, we must describe behavior in multiple settings, not one. We're looking for traits, aren't we? Traits. Traits. Boy, that's important as opposed to states. We're looking for enduring qualities. Those, those that are displayed at home, in recreation, at work. We're looking for traits. And the fifth, we're looking at behavior over multiple time periods. We might be working with a client one day. That's just one little slice of that person's life. As I mentioned, I've been putting a friend's work. I was called to a school district uh, two years ago because the child was retested during the summer time and her scores fell dramatic. And the school district was wondering why there would be such a decrease in intellectual and achievement. And so they said, come down, test this child, interview this child, find out what happened. So I began by interviewing the child, testing her. She came back in the afternoon and we interpreted the data together. And my data were very consistent with data that were three or four years ago, not that were consistent with the school district. And I said to her, how come your scores fell so low, were, were so low when you were tested two months ago? She said, I didn't like the psychologist. And I wanted to get out as soon as possible. Moreover, he tested me in the summertime, and that was my free time. And I thought that was an imposition. Again, looking at behaviors over time, the history of the persons, not just on the day in which you may have worked with that person. How many here know of the international classification of function? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many else know of the international classification of function? Go on the website for the World Health Organization and, yes. Yeah, uh, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, right. Right. Stand up. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Where was one to do? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Good. Because this is the emerging model, not for psychology, but for all professions. It's our attempt to view behavior from a from three broad perspectives. I have put figure one about here. I was hoping to have the uh, overhead, to, and I never requested it, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll describe it, maybe take two or three minutes. But please go to the World Health Organization's international website and acquire information on the international classification of function. It's a biosocial, psychological model for describing behavior. It's not interested in diagnosis. Because if again our first task is to accurately describe <coughs> behavior. It examines impairment of physiological, physical, and psychological functions. Body functions are those that we typically focus upon, psychological, physiological, and psychological functions, including mental sensory and respiratory and digestive functions. It examines the body structure or skeletal area our anatomy, including our brain. The activities focus upon whether a person executes a task. Think of your grandmother, perhaps if you have an elderly mother or father, their ability to assume daily functions, or maybe certain limitations. There are others who have the ability to perform and don't perform. And so the term Participation becomes important. Distinguishing between whether a person has the ability and displays the ability, or whether the person has the ability and, and 
for some reason she was not for this plan. So the book considers both environmental and personal factors in describing behavior. Um, I'm